Second Timothy is Paul's last epistle and final words to a dear son in the faith. He addresses the call and life of a minister of God while disclosing much of how he conducted himself in ministry. In chapter 1, Paul challenges us not to be ashamed of testifying to our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we are back to 2 Timothy. Just a little background. Uh, the Apostle Paul has spent about 24 years doing ministry from the time he was launched out of the church in Antioch. Uh, about 24 years traveling. He's traveled to about 50 major cities of his time. Uh, they tell us he traveled about 10,000 miles by road. Actually, they're walking or traveling on some sort of a, you know, animal carriage, 10,000 miles, maybe 3,000 mi- more miles on sea, preaching the gospel. He's done a lot. And uh, 18 of those years, Timothy has been with him. He has nurtured this young man, Timothy. He has appointed him now to take care of the church in Ephesus. And then Paul is heading back to Rome. This is about AD 67. And on his way back to Rome, he writes his first epistle to Timothy, which we studied. And the first epistle is more ge- addressing how Timothy should take care of the local church. Now Paul is back in Rome and he's imprisoned a second time. This is AD 67, AD 68. And at this point in his life, Paul knows death is imminent. He's going to be killed very soon. He's, uh, he knows at any point he's going to be beheaded for his faith. And so he writes his final epistle, his last letter. And he's writing it to Timothy, a beloved son in the faith. And this letter is very personal because he shares more of his own personal life as a minister of God. And he's addressing Timothy as a minister and sharing very important things um, uh, that, that a man of God or a minister of God should keep in mind. So with that background, uh, we're going to read the first chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, we'll just read the entire chapter and then bring out some uh, truths from this for us. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you, To the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Nor of me his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel. According to the power of God. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works. But according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. 
The, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So let's go from verse 1. Paul acknowledges that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So it is God who determines that. You know, we don't decide ourselves that, okay, I'm going to be an apostle. I'm going to be this. I'm going to... It's God's will, right? God says, okay, I'm calling you to be this. So God decided, God called Paul to be an apostle, an apostle by the will of God. And notice he says, and with the promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now think about this. Here's a man who's facing death. And what does he talk about? The promise of eternal life. The Greek there is zoe, the unending, the eternal life, the God kind of life. So in the face of death, he's saying, I've got something that nobody can take away. I've got the promise of eternal life. I've got the promise of eternal life. And then he says in verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace... From God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace, mercy, peace come from God. He's our source. Which means there is an unlimited supply of grace, mercy and peace. Unlimited. Because this comes from God. It doesn't come from things. It doesn't come from the church. It doesn't come from the pastor. It doesn't come from any human source. It comes from God. So when you pray for yourself, you're praying grace, mercy, and peace. And say, God, I want more grace. I, want, want, I, ask, I ask for your mercy on my life. I ask for your peace. And there is an unlimited supply of this. When you're praying for somebody else, you pray for God's grace, mercy, and peace on them. And it's unlimited. It's a bound, abounding supply. Of grace, mercy, and peace. Verse 3. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. Now this whole thing about pure conscience. Do you remember in 1 Timothy? Many times he talked about it. In fact, three times. He talks about having a pure conscience. Or as some, depending on your version, it may be a good conscience or a clear conscience. He talked about the importance of that. And here he's telling, talking about himself. And he says, I served God with a pure. I think this is so important for all of us as ministers of God. And in fact, for all of us as people of God. That we serve God with a clear conscience. You cannot have a clear conscience if we are not doing what is right in the sight of God and man. What's going to give us a clear conscience? When I know that I'm walking right before God and Man, that's what's going to give me a clear conscience. And he says, I'm serving God with a clear conscience. My conscience is clear. I'm not violating anything before God and before man. And he says, as my forefathers did. And of course, he's referring to his ancestors, you know, right from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on to the, uh, to the uh, uh, descendants of Abraham. He, and he's acknowledging that they served God with a pure conscience. They did not have the revelation that Paul had or that we have. But they walked according to the revelation they had and they did whatever they knew was right in the sight of God according to the revelation that was given to them at that time. They walked with God with a pure conscience. And you and I walk with God with a pure conscience according to the revelation that God has given to us in our day, in our time. And he says, and then he expresses affection for Timothy. Timothy, I pray for you without ceasing. Day and night. I really care about you. I'm praying for you. Verse 4, he talks about the fact that he's longing to see Timothy uh, so that he could be filled with joy. And then verse 5, he says, I call to remembrance the genuine faith that was in you, that is in you, which was first in your grandmother Lois, then it was in your mother Eunice, and it is now in you also. That's so beautiful. 
the passing on of spiritual heritage. The genuine faith in your grandmother. I saw it in your grandmother. I saw it in your mother. And I'm also seeing it in you. Now, I want us to understand as God's people, this is the desire of God's hearts. He wants the faith that any generation has to be passed on to the succeeding generations. We find this in Isaiah 59 and verse 21 in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, Isaiah 59, 21. God says, this is my covenant with you. My spirit that is upon you and my word that is in your mouth will not depart out of your mouth, but will pass on to your children and to your children's children. God says, this is what I want. I want to see that spiritual truth and anointing that's on one generation to pass on to the next and to the next. And all of us, many of us are parents. Some of us will be parents someday. And some of us will eventually reach there. <laughs> but, but the point is this. God wants what he's, the truth he's given to one generation to pass on to the next and to the succeeding generations. Spiritual heritage. Now, it's important for us to understand that, that a lot of this happens. We can't force it. You can't force it into the next generations and generations to come. It's so important for us to steward it carefully by the life we live. In the classroom, many things are taught. But at home, more is caught than taught. You agree? More is caught than talks. Because even when you're not talking, your life is still speaking. Your life is still speaking. Even when you're not talking. So I encourage all of us, especially those of us who are parents, you know, the way that we steward what God has given to us into the, into the next generation, the generations after us, first of all, is to the life we live. Sometimes our kids get tired of all the talking we do. So like, mom, dad, enough. <laughs> Enough, dad. You know. But your life is speaking even when you're not talking. Right? You're imparting. You're communicating. You're releasing. And that's the desire of God's hearts. Verse 6 and 7, he says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I know it's, it seems evident from 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy that uh, young Timothy was, uh, had some inhibitions to using the gift that was in him. And that's why in 1 Timothy chapter 4, you remember, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you're a young man, but don't let anyone look down upon your youth. You know, you, you be an example. And then he say, in verse 14, he says, I'm reminding you, please exercise the gift of God in you. That is in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And he's writing that again in 2 Timothy. He finds it important. So for some reason, Timothy is being inhibited from using the gift of God that's in him. So once again, he's reminding in verse 6, Timothy, I remind you, stir up the gift of God that is in you. And that's for all of us. You know, I believe, and, I, and I'm sure you agree with me, that God has placed gifts in all of us. There are things in each one of us. He designed us that way. And we have to stir up the gift of God. The word there literally means to fan, fan into flame. Stir it up. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. Don't let it become dormant. Don't let the flame die out. Stir it up. How do you and I stir up the gifts? Of course, one, when you're talking about spiritual gifts, you spend time in worship, you spend time in prayer, you spend time in the Word, uh, you spend time around people who'd encourage that gift. Uh, and uh, also, most importantly, use the gift. The more you use it, the stronger it's going to become in your life. So step out and use what God's given you. Now, so I appreciate young people like Melvin, Nobody told Melvin, Melvin, you need to produce an album. He took the initiative. Now he realized he's got a desire to do something. He went on and did it. You know, and invested his own time and energy to get it all done. And so 
for each of us, there are gifts that God has placed. We need to stir it up. Use the gifts that God has given to us. And then because Timothy has been inhibited, Paul reminds him in verse 7, Timothy, you need to use the gift of God because God has not given us a spirit of fear. Don't let fear hold you back. So many times the reason we don't use what God's given us, we are afraid. Oh, afraid of what will people think? A fear of failure, fear of not meeting expectations. Uh, fear of, you know, failing. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, I just don't do it right the first time. There's so many things that hold us back. Fear, in many different forms, hold us back from using what God's given to us. But he says, look, God's not given us a spirit of fear. But he's given us the Holy Spirit, who's the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. The word sound mind there literally means self-control, self-governing ability. So the Holy Spirit empowers us, gives us power, Love and a sound mind. So this is used in the context of gifts. So the gift of God must be exercised by the power of God, in the love of God, and with self-control. Let me repeat that. The gifts of God must be used in the power of God, with the love of God, and with self-control. For example, you know, sometimes... People do all kinds of crazy things. They actually go out of control. <laughs> and then they say, the Holy Spirit made me do it. Hey, the Holy Spirit brings love, power, love, and self-control. <laughs> so if it's really the Holy Spirit, there is self-control, self-governing ability in the exercise of the gifts. So you can't use that as an excuse just to do anything we want. Right? Verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So given the fact that God has given us, has not given us fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind, he says, you know, don't be ashamed of testifying for Jesus. Don't be ashamed. But I want you to share, and don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner, but share in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. You know, our ability to share in the sufferings of the gospel actually comes, uh, is actually empowered by the Holy Spirit. That same word power, is, the word power is dunamis. It's the same word that's used for miracle power. So the miracle working power of God is what enables us to share in the sufferings of the gospel. The same power that brings healings, deliverance, miracles. That same power also empowers you and me to share in the sufferings of the gospel. Are you with me? Yes or no? Yes. I know it's warm here, tiring here, but just bear with me. Suffer with me for... No, no. <laughs> just joking, right? All right, verse 9. God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Jesus before the world began. We have been saved, but we are also called. If you are saved, you are called. So tell your neighbor, you are saved, you are also called. Right? So some people say, I am waiting for the call. Hey, call has already been given to you. If you are saved, you are also who has saved us and called us. You're already called. And this call is a holy calling. It's a call to a life of holiness and godliness and moral purity. It's a holy calling. Not according to our works. That means God didn't say, well, you got a bachelor's degree. So here's your call. You got a master's degree. Here's a bigger call. You got a PhD. Here's a bigger call. Not according to. To our, the call of God that is on your life. God did not put it in proportion to your achievements, your, you know, success in this world. No. That's why the Bible says God has chosen the weak things of the world to confirm things that are strong. He's chosen the foolish things of the world to confirm things that are wise. So not according to our works not according to what we've done or the life we lived or how good we've been 
but according to his own purpose and grace that's been given to us. So think about this. Call, purpose, grace. God always calls us to a purpose and he also gives us the grace to fulfill that purpose. So you've been called, but you've been called for a purpose and there is enough grace to empower you to fulfill that purpose. Amen? You've been called for a purpose and there is enough grace to help you fulfill that call and that purpose that's on your life. It was given to us in Christ Jesus. And it says even God decided this even before time began. Verse 10, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So Jesus came. He is our Savior. He saved us. He's abolished death. He's brought death to cease. And he's given us life and immortality. So through Jesus, each one of us, because of our personal faith in him, we know we have life and immortality. Once again, Paul affirming this truth, knowing that he's going to die. And saying, Jesus is my Savior. I have life. I have immortality. Through the gospel. Amen. And we know this. That this life and immortality. Is, will be given to us. It's a, a, a future inheritance. It will be given to us. At the resurrection. According to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Corinthians 15. The Lord himself will descend. And the dead in Christ will arise. And mortal will put on. Immortality at that time. But that's the hope we have in the gospel. Are you all with me? Now, there is some sort of a wrong teaching going around of immortality now. It started somewhere in South Africa and it's now being preached even in Bangor City. Immortality now. You never need to die. Unfortunately, all the people started preaching and have already died. You know? <laughs> but they still keep preaching that. Now, you can't use this verse to preach immortality now because we understand scripture has to be interpreted in the rest of scripture. And the rest of scripture tell us very clearly immortality will be given to us in the future when the Lord himself returns and the dead in Christ are raised. Right? So don't let anybody use this scripture to tell you you are immortal right now. You never need to die. All right. Verse 11. He says, now this gospel to this, I'm appointed a, 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 a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. So he talks about his own call. And verse 12, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. So Paul says, you know, this, for this beautiful, glorious gospel, Jesus our Savior, he has abolished death and he's given us life and immortality he says for this I'm suffering he's a prisoner in Rome he's in chains but he says even though I'm suffering I'm, I've been humiliated he says I am not ashamed I'm not ashamed and why does he say I'm not ashamed he says because I know whom I have believed I know in whom I have believed. The one whom I have believed. He is the one who has given me the promise of life. He is Jesus Christ the Savior. He is the source of grace, mercy and peace. He is the one who has abolished death and has given life and immortality. I know whom I have believed. And I also know that he is able to keep safeguard. To preserve, to protect. What I have committed to him. Until that day. I have placed my life in his hands. And he is well able to keep it. Amen. Whom have you believed? In whose hands have you placed your eternity, your present and your future? Paul says, I know whom I believe. And I know he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. 
Now that latter part of that verse in verse 12 could also be, tra it could be translated both ways. He is able to keep what I have committed to him or he's able to keep what he has committed to me. And both ways are perfect, are great. That means what he has given to me, he's going to also preserve it. He's going to protect me down here and he's also going to preserve what I've given to him. He's able to keep it until that day. He's not going to lose it. Amen? I know whom I have believed. Then in verse 13, he says, Timothy, now he's speaking to Timothy as a minister of God. He says, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Now remember, one main reason why Paul left Timothy in Ephesus was to protect that church from false teaching. If you remember from chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. It says, I put you there in Ephesus so that you warn people that they don't teach any other doctrine. That's why I'm putting you there, Timothy. One of your responsibilities is to guard the church from false teaching. And so now, in order to help Timothy do that, he's reminding Timothy in verse 13, hold on to the pattern of sound words, true words, which, which you have heard from me. It's very important. You know, today... In the church, unfortunately, in the church, we have so much of wrong teaching happening. And it comes through great men and women of God who are seduced in small things. First Timothy chapter 4, Timothy said, in the latter day, Paul said, in the latter days, there will be seducing spirits who will promote doctrines, teachings of demons. And they come into the church. Through the leaders who are seduced. They're not holding on to the pattern of sound words. Which has been actually given to us in the word of God. I don't want to go out and start enumerating those things. But I want us to understand that not everything you hear every great preacher say is necessarily right. You've got to check if that is sound doctrine. Is it lining up to the word of God? Because there are seducing spirits just causing people to deviate a little bit. And that can have disastrous results. And so he tells Timothy, Timothy, I want you to hold on to sound words. The what I've taught you, hold on to it. Stay with the teaching of scripture. Stay with the word of God. And then he says in verse 14, Timothy, the good thing which I've committed to you, which was committed to you, you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. What has been given to you. You guard, you preserve with the help of the Holy Spirit. He's actually repeating what he gave in 1 Timothy 6.20. When he closed off his first episode, he said, Timothy, oh Timothy, guard what has been committed to your trust. He's repeating it again here in verse 14. Timothy, what has been committed to you, I want you to guard, I want you to keep with the help of the Holy Spirit. So you and I as believers need the Holy Spirit to guard, to protect what has been committed to us. Some people say, no, I don't believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the Bible, the word of God tells us about the Holy. You can't read the Bible without the Holy Spirit. The Bible was written by the Holy Spirit. And we need the Spirit of God. His guidance, His anointing within us teaches us all things and guides us in all truths. We need the anointing within to help preserve the deposit of the Word of God and the truth in our lives. The last few verses, verses 15 to 18, I'll just summarize this. In verse 15, Paul says, you know, Timothy, you know that some of these people from Asia... They've actually distanced themselves from me because I'm now a prisoner. I'm a Roman, a prisoner of Rome in chains. And so some of them have distanced themselves. They don't want anything to do with me. They don't want to associate with me. They have distanced themselves. And then he names two men, probably their leaders. And we don't read anything about them elsewhere. Verse 15. But then in verse 16 through 18, he mentions about a man named Onesiphorus. He says, Timothy, this man Onesiphorus, He's been such a good man. When I was in Ephesus, he came and took care of me. And when I came to Rome, he came all the way to Rome searching for me. You know, those days, no mobile phones. 
Hi, hi, Paul. This is Onesiphorus. Where are you? You know, he had to search literally. Where is Paul? Where have they imprisoned him? But he came to Rome. He searched out and sought and found Paul. And then he ministered to Paul. He, Paul says, he ministered to me. He refreshed me. And he says, he was not ashamed of my chains. He was not ashamed to associate himself with a man of God, but who was now in chains like a criminal. Not ashamed. A key thing that I'd like us to take away from this chapter is simply this. Don't be ashamed. Paul tells Timothy. Timothy. This is in verse 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. He says, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me his prisoner. Don't be ashamed Timothy. Of Jesus Christ and of associating yourself with true men and women of God. Don't be ashamed. Then Paul himself says in verse 12, I am not ashamed. I know whom I have believed. Then as he closes off this episode, he says, Hey, I know one other man, Onesiphorus. He was not ashamed to identify with me as a man of God, but right now in chains like a criminal. He was not ashamed. So saints, just think about the faith that you and I have. Right from that first century church, men and women have given their lives for their faith in Jesus Christ. You and I sit here today. We've got so much going for us. We've got comfort. We've got tools. We've got technology. We've got all kinds of things. But in the middle of all that, we need something that says, I will not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed to associate myself with men and women of God, true ministers of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I will stir up the gift of God that he has given and I will use it. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, sound mind, self-control. Amen. Now I pray this morning that God will stir up in each of our hearts that unashamedness for our faith in Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid if you're in a restaurant to put your head down and pray loudly in the name of Jesus. Don't pray the headache prayer, you know. People think you got a headache. Your head is on the table. Oh God, bless my food. Hey, pray boldly. Loud enough for the waiters to hear. For the next table to hear. Father, thank you for this food. Don't be ashamed. At least they hear somebody is praying to the name of Jesus. Maybe they will copy you. And they think, man, maybe even I can pray in the name of Jesus. You never know how you can affect somebody. Don't be ashamed in the middle of a mall to just say, hey, I'm going to pray. Take a moment to pray or wherever you are don't be ashamed to live out your faith in our day in our generation amen god has not given us a spirit of timidity of fear but of power love and self-control sound mind amen don't be ashamed if somebody says, are you a Christian? No, my name is Christian. No. <laughs> no. Yes, say this. Yes, I am a believer in Jesus. Where were you Sunday? I went for lunch. I don't want to tell them I went to church in the morning. Don't be ashamed. I went to church. I'm going to worship Jesus. Don't be ashamed of your faith in Christ. Amen. Paul says, I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Let's stand to our feet, please. This morning before I just pray over all of us and we just pray together. You know, this is so powerful. Paul says, I know whom I have believed. If there's anyone here this morning and you've never...
turned from your own ways and made a decision in your life to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is our Savior, the one who died for our sins, who was buried and who rose up again. He is the one who can give us life and immortality. But if you've never made a choice in your life up until this point to believe in Jesus Christ, to save you from your sins, and, and to bring you into his own kingdom and, and take ownership of your life, if you've never done that, I'm sure all of us here would say, you know, you need to do that. You need to know in whom you've believed. If you've never done that, you might be up on the floor here. You might be in the basement, wherever you are. If you've never done this before in your life, if you've never believed in Jesus to forgive you your sins, but this morning you feel an urge in your heart that you need to do this. I just want to invite you to just pray a prayer with me. The prayer is not going to save you. The Lord Jesus is the one who saved you. But this prayer is just a help for you to reach out to the Savior. The Bible says whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This prayer is only to help you call on the name of the Savior, on the name of the Lord. He's the one who will save you. So if you don't mind, and you'd like to do this, just pray this prayer with me, please. If you've never done this before in your life. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need a savior. You, O oh Lord, are the savior of the world. I come to you, forgive my sin, come into my life, make me a new person and help me follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus name, amen, amen. Father, in this place, I ask you, God, that you release your signs, your wonders, your miracles, your healings, your deliverances for each one of your people, Father. That supernatural provision will come into their lives to meet needs they face. That you will help them can see their debts canceled. You will see, God, you will cause them to grow professionally in every area of their lives. You cause them, Lord, to push past limitations, to break free from things that hold them. God, in this place, the healing power flow. Healing people of every sickness, every disease. Let pain disappear. Let problems of the joints just disappear. Let arthritis leave and every sickness, disease leave. Let your people walk the healing that's provided for us. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name. Let's rise to our feet, please. I'll just pronounce the benediction and we close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org 
Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.